The Lord answered me, write down this vision, clearly inscribe it on tablets so one may easily read it. For the vision is yet for the appointed time. It testifies about the end and will not lie. Though it delays, wait for it, since it will certainly come and will not be late. Look, his ego is inflated. He is without integrity, but the righteous one will live by his faith. Moreover, wine betrays. An arrogant man is never at rest. He enlarges his appetite like Sheol, and like death, he is never satisfied. He gathers all the nations to himself. He collects all the peoples for himself. Won't all of these take up a taunt against him, with mockery and riddles about him? They will say, Woe to him who amasses what is not his, how much longer, and loads himself with goods taken in pledge. Won't your creditors suddenly arise, and those who disturb you wake up? Then you will become spoil for them. Since you have plundered many nations, all the peoples who remain will plunder you because of human bloodshed and violence against lands, cities, and all who live in them. Woe to him who dishonestly makes wealth for his house, to place his nest on high, to escape the grasp of disaster. You have planned shame for your house by wiping out many peoples and sinning against your own self. For the stones will cry out from the wall, and the rafters will answer them from the woodwork. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with injustice. Is it not from the Lord of armies that the peoples labor only to fuel the fire, and countries exhaust themselves for nothing? For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the water covers the sea. Woe to him who gives his neighbors drink, pouring out your wrath and even making them drunk in order to look at their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace instead of glory. You also drink and expose your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter disgrace will cover your glory. For your violence against Lebanon will overwhelm you. The destruction of animals will terrify you because of your human bloodshed and violence against lands, cities, and all who live in them. What use is a carved idol after its craftsman carves it? It is only a cast image, a teacher of lies. The one who crafts its shape trusts in it and makes idols that cannot speak. Woe to him who says to wood, wake up, or to mute stone, come alive. Can it teach? Look, it may be plated with gold and silver, yet there is no breath in it at all. But the Lord is in his holy temple. Let the whole earth be silent in his presence. And may the Lord bless to us the reading of his word. Uh, please be seated. Good morning, Refuge Church. I think any of us who have ever met the man know that our pastor, James, is a film buff. And so, last time on Habakkuk. <laughs> Habakkuk has, has brought a complaint, not a whine, but a complaint. God, there is injustice, there is wickedness in the land. Help, do something. And so God said, okay, Habakkuk, I'm sending Babylon. I'm sending the Chaldeans. They're going to come and they're going to do something. And last week, we heard about how Habakkuk responded to that. Wait, God, what? The Babylonians. Well, first, before I say anything else, Lord, you are eternal and you're, you're holy. You're pure and you're intolerant of evil. You are the foundation in my rock. So why would you send us the bad guys? The Babylonians are bullies, and they gobble whole peoples and nations up. They devour them, and like fishermen, they plunder, and they pull in everything. 
They're plunderers and they're slavers. Don't send us the bad guys. Don't send us Babylon. In our passage today, God responds. And I think that that in itself, that God responds to Habakkuk, is remarkable. If we read in Job, God doesn't really give Job an answer. God says, Job, who are you to make such a demand? Who are you to make a demand that I answer? God doesn't say that to Habakkuk, though. He says, you know what, Habakkuk, write this down. Write down this vision clearly and scribe it in tablets so that many may read it. In fact, the way that that's actually written, the idiom used here is not just write it down clearly. It's make it big so that someone running by can read this. In other words, Habakkuk, take out a billboard. Write this down. And so that got me thinking about what, well, it got me thinking about a sign that I grew up with, a landmark from nearby. Are you on the right road, it says, Dixie Baptist Church. Funny thing about this is that it's a little south of where I grew up, so if I was headed home from anywhere, it's on I-75, it's on the freeway, going 75, 80 miles an hour, because we, we speed, and the speed limit's 70. You could read this sign that says, are you on the right road, and see a picture of Jesus just looking off into the distance. It's about halfway between Detroit and Flint, where I lived. And so this sign always said to me, you're on the right road, you're headed home, you're almost there, you're about half an hour out. Ever since I was a kid, that sign has been there for as long as I can remember. And I was talking to my dad, and my dad said, geez, that sign has been there for as long as I can remember. That sign has been there for generations. Are you on the right road? God is reliable. Habakkuk, write this down so anyone can read it. Take out a billboard. Let it be seen. This vision isn't for right now. It's for the future. But it'll come, and it will not lie. God is reliable. And so, like I can be reminded that yes, I'm on the right road. We can read in, in this passage, read in this this declaration, this vision, are you on the right road? Isaiah chapter 46, verses 8 through 10 says, Remember this and be brave. Take it to heart, you transgressors. Remember what happened long ago. For I am God, and there is no other. I am God, and no one is like me. I declare the end from the beginning. And from long ago, what is not yet done, saying, my plan will take place and I will do my will. I always loved that phrase, declare the end from the beginning. Take heart, be brave. When our enemies seem to be winning, as they sometimes seem to be now, take heart and be brave. Take heart and be brave when the unrighteous seem to be devouring those more righteous than they, as they sometimes seem to be now. Take heart and be brave when the arrogant seem to devour everything like the grave, and they gather whole nations to themselves. As they sometimes seem to be now. Live by faith and the just and reliable God, the God who judges. And he's not slow as we might consider slowness, but instead he patiently gives us a chance to repent. So take heart and be brave. The section headings in our Bible are not divinely inspired. They're put there to be hopefully helpful at some point. 
I think that the section heading in our, our passage today uh, says five woe oracles is actually a pretty good description of the verses to follow. Our passage says, woe to him who amasses what is not his. Woe to him who seeks security above integrity. Woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and injustice. Woe to him who seeks shame and embarrassment for others. Woe to him who puts trust in idols. You see, God is sovereign. God is holy. Like Habakkuk said, God is pure and intolerant of evil. He is our firm foundation and he will stand, but evil will not. Do not despair. God calls out, woe to these. The word woe here means to us a condition of affliction from misfortune or grief. But it can also be an interjection like, oh no, oh no, Ross and Carrie, oh no. But it can also be, ha. And so that begs a question, what is the appropriate Christian response to our enemies? I think we all know how to fill in this answer right now. Jesus tells us it's love and forgiveness. We must love our enemies, pray for those who persecute us, love those who would do us harm. Sometimes with American politics as they are now, we feel like our political rivals are out to get us. Even when they disagree on something as fundamental as abortion or gender identity, they seem to level attacks against us. We are still called to love them. And sometimes we have personal rivals who seem to have it out for us. I myself, I work with somebody who is just hard to work with. And it feels like every time I'm working with her, she is out to sabotage my work. And I've had conversations about how detrimental it seems to be that she is on the team. I don't like working with her. But we're called to love her, to love people like that, who might seem to be working at cross purposes to us. Love them. Last week, our prayer chain had something heartbreaking, devastating. One of our friends in Pakistan, who pastors a church, sent us a request for prayer because there was a father and son in their community who were accused of burning a Quran falsely. And their Muslim neighbors dragged them into the streets and publicly murdered them. We're called to love our Muslim neighbors. And the pastor of that church is called to love the people who killed this father and son in the streets. We're called to love our enemies. And church, we do know this. We preach this often. We also hear it coming at us from the world in a much more perverse sort of way. But we get it both ways. Love and forgiveness. Love everyone. In the church, we preach it because it's something that's contrary to us. It's not easy. It goes against our human nature. It goes against our sinfulness in our flesh. So much so that there's a weight even talking about that story of our, our brothers and sisters in Pakistan. Because loving our enemies means that we have to earnestly seek to share heaven with the people who would kill us. It means that we have to earnestly seek to share eternity with people who we would rather not spend five minutes with. I 
Let's take a moment. Imagine with me. Lay aside the weight of some of these bigger ideas and let's go close to home. Imagine you are trapped in an elevator. Who is a specific person that you would least like to see trapped in that elevator with you? Think about it. Do you have someone in mind? That's the person you need to be praying for, to evangelize. Seek to share Jesus when they would share violence. When they would share working against you, share Christ. That's what it means to love our enemies. And then we hear it from the world, especially today. Welcome to Pride Month. Love everyone. By love, they often mean agree. By enemies, they mean me. And so, love your enemies to the world means even when you don't line up with my ideas, when you don't agree with me, Love means to lay aside your beliefs and agree with me and help me to do what I want to do anyway. I'm not hurting anyone. Right? We hear it both ways. Church, which way has more power? Which way has more weight? We know what loving our enemies means. But in light of woe to our enemies, woe to the unjust, woe to that list of he who amasses wealth unjustly. What's our response when our enemies fall? Is it okay to be happy when our enemies are destroyed? It's kind of a prickly question to ask, especially from the pulpit. We spend so much time, because rightly we spend time, Jesus saying, love your enemy, love your neighbor. Rightly, we spend our time there. Sometimes I wonder if we don't do a good job of explaining things like Psalms that says, happy is the man who destroys you. Happy is the man who destroys you, Babylon. How can we sing our songs when you carry us off into exile? Actually, that psalm says, happy is the one who takes your little ones and dashes them against the rocks. How do we deal with that? Especially in light of love your enemies. And I think the difference really is that as hard as this is to talk about, And the human heart is proud and it is so easy to get it wrong that we tend to, in our nature, delight in the suffering of enemies. I'm going to say that again because I kind of tripped over it. It is easy to delight in the suffer of our enemies because that is natural to us. But we must guard our hearts against that. Do not delight in the suffering of your enemies, but do delight in the justice of our God. It is appropriate to delight in our God who is just. He is the one who says, vengeance is mine, I will repay. We can never usurp that right. Do not try to rob God. We must love our enemies, pray for them. When they persecute us, love and pray for. Seek Christ when they seek harm. And I confess that as lately as last Sunday, I struggled with this. There is somebody else, a different person at work that I just didn't like working with. I never got a good answer out of her. She never responded. She always seemed to be making things worse. And her last day 
was a week ago Friday. Last Sunday, I got the email saying she had left, and my first thought was, hi-ho, one of the witches is gone. <laughs> Immediately followed with, oh Lord, I'm sorry, that was not right. It's a funny thought, but it was not right. And in that moment, when Pastor James and his wife Kat were sitting across the table for me, I sinned. And I repented. And it was funny because the conversation also followed to somebody saying, oh no, Jonathan. But it turned out it was a quote from the D&D movie, oh no, Jonathan. <laughs> and so it was all in that moment of sin and woe and repentance all there at the table. It's not okay for our, us to rejoice in our enemy's suffering, but it is appropriate. It is a delight in our God's justice. And so keep that in mind. That's the line. That's the line we have to walk. Habakkuk says, woe to all of those who take up, or excuse me, let me start this over again. Uh, Won't all those who take up a taunt against him with mockery and riddles about him. They, they will say, woe to him who amasses what is not his. How much longer? And loads himself with goods taken in pledge. Won't your creditors suddenly arise and those who disturb you wake up? Then you will become a spoil for them. Since you have plundered many nations, all peoples who remain will plunder you because of human bloodshed and violence against land, cities, and all who live in them. Woe to him who amasses what is not his. Babylon had an aggressive policy of expansion, gobbling up their neighbors, gathering them to themselves. How much longer for Babylon? It was 58 years between when they sacked Jerusalem and when they fell. 58 years is a long time for Israel to cry out for, gen for, for justice. It's not the longest time they cried out in Scripture, but it, when you look at the life of an individual, suffering under 58 years of suffering, it feels like a really long time. It's longer than I've been alive. When I was in college, I had an accounting class, an accounting 101. And Caesar, before I say anything about accounting, I love you, brother, and I am glad that you are the treasurer. I try to pay attention, earnestly I do. You start talking and sometimes I'm just trying to keep up. I need somebody else to help me with accounting. I learned maybe two, maybe three things in that accounting 101 class. Uh, the first was balance sheets, half the balance. <laughs> One of the things that stood with me because it seemed counter to me, I didn't expect it when I learned it, was that unearned income is not an asset, but a liability. And I had to kind of get my head around that. I thought all income would be good. It would be asset. It wouldn't be liability. But unearned income is something that you have to make sure that you can pay back. And so it sits there on the balance sheet in the liability column because it has to balance. And then I got thinking about businesses. And one really that stood out to me, uh, some of you might remember and some of you might be before your time, uh, but about 25 years ago, 24 years ago actually, in the year 2000, there was a rather popular music sharing service called Napster. I hear laughter from the front row already because you know where this is going. Turns out Napster actually started because there was a 19-year-old kid who wanted to share music with his friends and so he built something where he could do that. And then because the internet, it got out of hand. And before you know it, in 2000, there were hundreds of thousands of users sharing music illegally with one another. 
they amassed a vast collection of songs that were not theirs. And in 2000, the band Metallica discovered on Napster a song that they had not released. It was a demo for, I think it was a movie. And so they sued to the tune of $100,000 per illegally downloaded song. Metallica won $10 million. And they were quickly followed by a band of other musicians, record labels, all filing suit. Turns out Napster is still around today, by the way. I looked. You can sign up. It's much different. I did not sign up. <laughs> but Napster is now famous for the turn of the last century scandals like Bernie Madoff and Enron. Big ordeals. And people gathered what was not theirs and woe to them because the bill came due. And woe to him who dishonestly makes wealth for his house to place his nest on high to escape the grasp of disaster. You've planned shame for your house by wiping out many peoples and sinning against your own self. For the stones will cry out from the wall and the rafters from the, will answer from the woodwork. Woe to him who seeks security at the cost of integrity. Babylon was legendary for its pride and its security. In Daniel chapter 4, we read an interesting story. A story about King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon who took pride in what he had built. The security and majesty of his land. Listen to what he says. The king exclaimed, Is this not Babylon the great that I have built to be a royal residence for my vast power and for my majestic glory? The problem here is that he had already been warned about his pride. That God, our God, had given him a dream that said, your pride is going to lead you to disaster. And so as the king says these words, behold what I built, and the power and the majesty and the glory, a voice from heaven comes and says, I warned you. And now you will live like a beast and you will be humbled. This also kind of reminds me of an old fairy tale. When I say old, I mean ancient. It turns out it was way older than I originally thought it was. It's a story about fate. There once was a merchant in Baghdad who sent his servant to the market to buy provisions. And in a little while, the servant came back white and trembling and said, Master, just now when I was in the marketplace, I was jostled by a man in the crowd. And when I turned, I saw it was death that had jostled me. He looked at me and made a threatening motion. Now lend me your horse and I will ride away from the city and avoid my fate. I will go to Samara and there death will not find me. Samara is about 80 miles away from Baghdad. Should take about three days of horseback riding, at least at a regular pace. But the merchant lent him his horse, and the servant mounted it, and he dug in his spurs, and as fast as the horse could gallop, he went. The merchant went down to the marketplace, and he saw the man standing in the crowd, and he said to him, why did you make a threatening gesture to my servant when you saw him this morning? That was not a threatening gesture, the man said. It was a start of surprise. I was astonished to see him in Baghdad, for I had an appointment with him tonight in Samarra. <laughs> Woe to the one who dishonestly gains wealth to provide security, because like the merchant servant, like King Nebuchadnezzar, he brings disaster onto himself. Instead, listen to the words of Jesus. 
don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can you add one moment to your life by worrying? Rather than striving, than conniving and, and scheming for yourself and your own security, trust in God's provision. Aren't you worth more than the sparrows? Psalm 24 tells us that it's not the one who is dishonest or scheming that can really climb to that true security, but instead it's the one with a pure heart and clean hands who is not appealed to what is false and not sworn deceitfully. He is the one who can climb the mountain of the Lord. He is the one who can climb to the height of security. We can't make ourselves secure by placing ourselves in jeopardy. And woe to him who seeks security at the cost of his integrity. For he will bring disaster on himself. And woe to him who builds a city with bloodshed and founds a town with injustice. Is it not from the Lord of armies that the people's labor only to fuel the fire and countries exhaust themselves for nothing. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the Lord's glory as the water covers the sea. Woe to him who builds on injustice and bloodshed. What a terrible thing it is to do a good thing and start it in sin. And once again, we see the perils of the human heart. How many ways can we taint good works and pervert them? Rather than starting with the right motives, we might start in pride. I have a great opportunity to do something good, and I deserve it, and so I'm going to go after it. Or maybe... We have a great opportunity to do something good, and yet we need to make some compromise to get it going. I wasn't originally going to talk about this, but one of the many movies that I've seen over at James and Cat's house was about a politician who had an opportunity for something good. He was going to run for governor, and he was going to be the right man for the job. But in order to start, he had to make a deal with a shady character. And the movie was about making compromises and selling one's soul to the devil. How easy it is to pervert something good by starting it poorly. Babylon is gone. Israel, as controversial as it is right now, remains. And in Romans chapter 9, the Apostle Paul tells us about the difference between those who are simply descended genealogically from Abraham and those who are the true children of the promise. Not all Jews are the children of the promise. And we have been grafted in and adopted into the family as children of the promise. If God has been gracious and so faithful even to the genetic lineage of the Jews that they are still around when Babylon is all but forgotten. His grace to us abounds. His sovereignty is revealed again and again. Psalm 127 tells us that unless it's the Lord who does the work, Unless it's the Lord who builds the house and watches the city, the labor is for nothing. And yet, the psalm continues and says, the Lord provides for his people while they sleep. 
Home nations exhaust themselves, work themselves to the bone for only temporary gain. And yet, the work of the Lord, that's the work that lasts. Colossians 3 tells us that what we do, we should do unto the Lord. He gives us an inheritance. That is good and lasting work. Do the work that God has prepared for you. Injustice is a poor foundation. It will be washed away in the sea of God's glory. Woe to him who builds on injustice, for that work will not last. And woe to him who gives his neighbors drink, pouring out your wrath and even making them drunk in order to look at their nakedness. You will be filled with disgrace instead of glory. You also drink and expose your uncircumcision. The cup in the Lord's right hand will come around to you and utter disgrace will cover your glory. For your violence against Lebanon will overwhelm you. The destruction of animals will terrify you because of your human bloodshed and violence against lands and cities and all who live in them. Woe to the one who seeks shame and embarrassment for his neighbors. Woe to the one who seeks to get one over on his neighbors. Babylon tore down the walls of Jerusalem and exposed the city to shame. And on a night of drunkenness and debauchery, Babylon fell. Actually, I really like the way that the King James translates that verse. It says, your glory will be covered in your shame. The King James says, utter disgrace as shameful spewing will be on your glory. In other words, you're going to vomit all over yourselves and cover up your glory in the shame of your vomit. It will come round to you. I'm going to bring this closer to home again. Seattle has a drug problem. This picture is taken from City Hall Park. This encampment is not there anymore. But I picked this picture in particular because it shows something that was shameful. And Seattle didn't do anything about it. Someone else had to come in, step in, and do something. I don't remember if it actually played out, but King County threatened to take this land away from the city of Seattle before anything got done. In this encampment, there was a lack of dignity. There was shame. There was drug use. There was violence. People died. There was a little girl, I believe she was about six years old, found abandoned in one of those tents. It was shameful. And it was right on the doorstep of the King County Sheriff's Office, the King County Court, Seattle City Hall, all a short walk. In fact, you can see in the background, one of those buildings is the King County Courthouse. Seattle has a problem, and we've allowed people to wallow in their addictions. We haven't helped. This is the world in which I live, and it colors the way I see the world. I see tents. I see, I see people on the streets. I see a lack of dignity in their living situations. Sometimes I even see places where we've, as a society, made it easy for people to indulge their addiction. This place was a safe injection site. And some years ago, I was sent to work there. And somebody asked me to help them do drugs. The choice of whether or not I would disobey the policies and rules of my organization was taken out of my hands because I was kind of an idiot and I didn't know how to help the person anyway. They asked me for something and I ended up saying, I'm sorry, I don't know anything. Uh, you'll have to wait until the next guy shows up. 
But then again, I didn't get the opportunity to say, I'm not going to help you with your addiction either. Many of us are now ashamed of our homeless problem, and we should be. We're covered in shame. Even a food bank that I'm familiar with, uh, that I like, I like the place, the, the people that are running it. Uh, I know this place, but it's dingy. It lacks a certain degree of dignity. Somebody higher up than them actually made that comment. I found out this last week that they are losing their funding and they will close. They'll be cut off. How much more so when we actively deny the image of God? Now, some of this is fear-driven. I know that I was in a community event last year and the question went around, are you afraid to go walking at night in your community? There were three people in the room who said, no, I'm not afraid. One was another man, almost as big as me, who was in good shape. He worked with the police. He was not a full police officer, but he worked alongside them, and he said he was not afraid. I was the second. I enjoy some of those same advantages. I'm six and a half feet tall, 300 pounds. If somebody is going to mess with me, then they're going to commit to messing with a big guy. The third person was a much smaller woman. And what she said really rang out and resounded with me. She says, I'm not afraid because I know them. It's harder for them to be threatening to her when she can walk up to them and say, hey, Frank, how are you doing today? How are you feeling? Joe, are you doing okay? I, I know there was something wrong with your foot. How are you feeling? takes the unknown out of it when you actively engage. So friends, how do we provide dignity? We seek Christ. Preach Christ. The people in that encampment, there was violence, there was, there was fear and threat. There was accident. There were people that I knew who had their tents burned down. But I also got to go into that encampment and get to know some of the people there. Not well. I wasn't part of their everyday lives. But I knew them to see them, to have a conversation. And I never felt in danger. Seek Christ because we're covered in shame. And woe to him who puts his trust in idols. Babylon praised their gods for their victory, their victory over our God, so they thought. I think it's easier or better said, Babylon praised their gods for the victory of our God. Actually, in last week's sermon, we read how they would praise their nets and not you, O Lord, for the victory. It's one of the things that Babylon levied against them. Even on the day of their fall, they worshipped their gods of gold and silver for providing them treasures from our God's temple. But their gods could do nothing. It wasn't their gods who had the victory. It was our God. We don't bow to carved statues. I have tiny little figurines all over my house for games, but not as objects of worship. Or do I? I think that we spend 
an inordinate amount of time worshiping maybe entertainment. What about our TVs, our sports, our games? This is something to consider, not trying to call anyone out for anything. But how do we worship God? And do we worship God in watching TV or movie? And that's a big thing that James will preach all the time. I love Pastor James's approach to how do we engage in a godly way? But you know, the thing is, woe to him who puts his trust in idols. I don't think that's just entertainment. What about woe to him who puts his trust in his family? Woe to him who puts trust in you know, the people around him, his neighborhood, his community, his anything. Because anything that is not God It says a lifeless stone to him. Our God will do his will. He is the one that is sovereign. He is the one who has power. Even other people. We can teach. We can speak. We can, we can engage with one another. But when compared to God, let the whole earth be silent. But the Lord is in his temple. Let the whole earth be silent in his presence. Our God will do his will. While the wicked may prosper now, God will work his justice. Woe to the wicked because they will fall, but give thanks to God who is rich in mercy, who gives us a chance to repent Repent and be saved. In fact, the same justice that rains destruction on the wicked, all of these woes, well, God promises his justice is forgiveness if we confess our sins. He is faithful and just to forgive them, to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Let the whole earth be silent in his presence. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for your sovereignty. Have mercy on us and help us to repent. Forgive us our sins, Lord. Help us to worship you and not to fall into these pits these traps. Lord, help us to go with dignity into the world to write these things on signs and to preach them and proclaim them like a billboard. Are you on the right road? Lord, let us us be on your road. Your holy and precious name we pray these things. Amen.